Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's Social Sciences for the Real World session at the SASE 2020 conference. Um, we're really uh, excited to, to have you. This is the, the second year of an initiative that was started in 2019, um, which really seeks to link uh, the world of academia with the world of practice. We have a dialogue between academics and practitioners around issues of contemporary interest. And this year, we have a really uh, exciting session on repurposing the corporation to save capitalism for itself, which we ask as a question, but can also be read as, as a statement. And in this moment of multiple crises, worldwide crises, you know, social, epidemiological, political, economic, um, examining the role of the corporation in the way the world is, uh, is proceeding, the way things are, things are going on in the world, is uh, we think a fundamental um, issue. So I'm I'm joined today by uh, my uh, co-chair, uh, Anna, Dr. Anna Scafelis um, of Harvard University, and we have a really distinguished panel, and uh, including uh, the other co-organizers, uh, Gerhard Schneider and Isabel Ferreira. Um, and I'll do a very quick introduction of the four panelists. The panelists will have some time to, to speak on the issue, so we've asked them to prepare statements to really discuss um, the issues at hand, and then we will open the floor to questions. I may take the chair's privilege and ask a question or two, but we know that you, the audience, will have questions, and we invite you to, to send them in as uh, as we're dialoguing, as we're speaking, and and we'll, we'll we hope to have a really robust um, discussion today. So, so to to start uh, again, I'm going to introduce the panelists. Uh, I'll start with Rosal uh, Veltmeyer Smith. Rosal Veltmeyer Smith. She's a portfolio manager for, in the fixed income division uh, for sustainable discretionary portfolios of Triodos Bank Private Banking. She has many years of experience uh, in the field of sustainable um, finance and investments and holds a bachelor's degree in business economics and master's degree in social uh, banking and finance. And she has uh, a really diverse background and will speak to these issues from, from someone who's really been embedded in the field for, for, for many years. Years. Uh, finally, she's the chairperson of the research committee of the Euromedion and associate of social banking. Um, next, uh, we have Isabel Ferreras. Dr. Isabel Ferreras is a, a long, <laughs> a long biography. I only give a part of it. Um, she's a senior tenured uh, fellow at the Belgian uh, National Research Foundation and a professor of sociology at the University of Leuven in, in Belgium, a senior research associate at the Labor and Work Life Program at the Harvard Law School, and a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences, Humanities, and Arts of Belgium. Um, her research focuses on understanding work in the context of the Western service-based economy, and she's developed a very unique critical po political sociology of work and has been involved really in the academic and I would say the activist and practitioner side of, of, of this space and, and we're very privileged to, to have her as a panelist uh, today. Um, Eric Breen is the principal at uh, Infinisys. He, is, he provides his, and his advisory provides in-depth in independent advice on integrating finance and sustainability. Um, and, you know, his goal, the goal of his company is to stimulate better informed, integrated decision making, which brings together financial return and, and sustainability, benefiting all stakeholders. He has a quarter century of experience in the asset management field and especially integrating finance and technology. And so he has some very, very interesting uh, insights to, uh, to provide us. And finally, uh, we have Jeroen Veltman, who is an associate professor at the Center for Entrepreneurship, Governance, and Stewardship at Nienreid Business University. He's an honorary 
senior visiting fellow at Cox Business School, and he's the section editor for corporate governance at the Journal of Business Ethics. Um, a particular note for, for, for this panel, he leads something called the Modern Corporation Project, which is a very interesting research project focusing on identifying and disseminating work and best practices which support long-term value, uh, value development and value creation for, for firms. So, so he, he too has a, some really interesting uh, insights to, to offer us. Um, so without further ado, what we'll do is go to the statements, the, the, the opening statements on, on this issue of repurposing the corporation to save capitalism for itself. So we'll go in the order that I, I just went. We'll start with um, Russell, and then we'll open the floor for, for, for questions. So please. Thank you very much, uh, Imran. And thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, interesting session. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to contribute to this debate. Um, first, please allow me some words on the, on the wonderful organization I work for. So Tridels Bank is, we are an in independent sustainable bank founded in the Netherlands uh, exactly 40 years ago. And we were founded on the conviction that banking can be a powerful force for good, right? So it's our mission to finance change and to change finance. And how do we do that? Uh, we finance change by exclusively investing in and lending to organizations and projects that have a positive impact on people and the environment. And we change finance by influencing the banking sector to become more transparent, uh, diverse and, and sustainable. So, um, looking at the current crisis that we are witnessing today, it's, it of course started as a health crisis, but has now emerged into an economic and uh, systemic crisis. And this crisis shows very clearly that our current economic system is by no means resilient. So we have no buffers, no, not financially, not socially, not ecologically. We lack diversity in production, supply chains, and so forth. We are totally dependent on economic growth and health effects are unevenly spread between, but also within countries. So what we are now experiencing is a severe global recession, higher global debt and increases in unemployment. Now Triedels Bank believes that anything we should do, um, we should start with the environmental boundaries. So what is the capacity of Mother Earth, what are the, the, the environmental boundaries? And within this capacity, we have to do everything that we can to optimize the contribution to the sustainable development goals. And that from this, the economic growth should be derived. So it shouldn't start with economic growth, but it should be the end. It should be the result of the environmental boundaries and maximization of the contribution to the sustainable development goals. So what we should aim for is not an economy that needs to grow, but needs to prosper. Now it's amazing to see how quickly governments came to the rescue when COVID-19 arrived. In a, in, in a period of less than 10 weeks, more than 15 trillion US dollars was spent on COVID-19. And the problem that we have with the packages that are how they are designed now is that particularly the part that came from the central banks doesn't reach the real economy. This money is only used to circulate in the financial economy and to stabilize the financial capital markets. And, and, and what amazes me is that governments are able to mobilize so much money in such a short period to fight COVID-19, whereas we lack the sense of urgency uh, to fight climate change, which is a, a, a much bigger problem and not just an environmental problem, but also a huge health and social uh, problem. But somehow we still don't feel the urgency. Now the question is, is it feasible and desirable to repurposing the co to cooperation to save capitalism from itself? I think the answer is yes. But it's not just a responsibility for the corporation itself, but also governments and financial institutions have an important role to play here. And 
few of the changes that we would like to propose is that, first of all, governments need to select which companies and sectors to save. So what we're currently saving is the old economy, and we need to move to a new economy. We need to move to financing sectors that can weather the crisis. We also need to make the public health help conditional on sustainability guidelines, which we are only hardly doing at the moment. And governments need to reform the policy agenda in terms of debt relief and restructuring and tax reforms. We should stop subsidizing harmful activities. Financial institutions play an important role. In 2008, we were part of the problem. Now banks can be part of the solution. If we all aim to direct our investments and finance to gear towards a sustainable transition. We need more diversity in corporations in order to safeguard resilience. So we need to move from global to local. Our current economy is aimed at efficiency, but also at specialism. That means that parts of the supply chain are concentrated in certain areas. And if that area collapses, then that uh, provides a huge challenge. And companies need to move from short-term objective to long-term long -term purpose. So the business of a company is to provide for need. And a nice example is indeed, as was mentioned in the announcement for the session, Danone. So Danone has now is going to turn itself into a purpose-driven company. And that means that the sole purpose of Danone is not to generate profit for its shareholders, but to do that in a way that will benefit customers' health and the health of the planet. So what these past decades have shown is that economic growth and sustainability don't really go hand in hand. Uh, what worries me if you see that the United Nations believes uh, in the opportunity of green growth, the European Commission presents its green, green Deal plan, which also focuses on a new growth strategy. But my question is, does green growth exist at all? Um, and I think how social science practitioners can help this uh, interesting and much needed debate is to provide um, social evidence for the solutions. And not so much evidence in terms of threats, but I, I believe much more in evidence that supports the opportunities um, that, we, uh, that we much need nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Rosal. <laughs> Thank you so much. So just for the panelists, I'm going to give you a one minute warning um, on your on your statement so that so that we just move forward and have time for questions. So please, Isabel, you, you are up. OK, thank you, Imran. Can you hear me fine? Is that good? Yes. OK, wonderful. Um, OK, hello, everyone. It's great to uh, be with you. Uh, although it would have been much nicer to be physically present uh, all together in Amsterdam, as it was fantastic to be together last year in New York City. Uh, and uh, this, was, uh, the, this forum was uh, indeed a, a great new experiment that we started um, last year. And I'm really uh, um, happy to be uh, with you today for this uh, new panel. Uh, I'm going to try to be very then clear cut in my uh, answer to the question so that it can really help hopefully uh, bring some uh, interesting debates. Uh, I guess my hand answer would be the following. I don't think we should repurpose uh, the corporation uh, in the sense that I think we should move beyond the corporation. And let me explain that. So um, what is the corporation? Uh, a simple definition uh, is the following. The corporation is the structuring of capital investment. That is a fairly standard uh, definition that is widely accepted across uh, national legal regimes. Um, what are firms is another interesting question, which is not, uh, um, not uh, in the, the title of this uh, panel today, but I think sits at really the crux of our problem. Firms are not simple economic organizations. They are actually political entities which are made of 
generally a corporation, but then many more other types of relationships. And these firms, uh, which actually organize the bulk of uh, work today, of the labor investment of workers, are actually governed by corporations. And so the main problem I want to get your attention to is the fact that firms are governed by a very specific type of actor, capital investors, while a huge constituency of these firms, which I think we can call labor investors, are completely left out of the government of firms. And that is uh, problems in terms of justice, but that's also problems in terms of e efficiency that we are more and more starting to realize today. But so the problem we face if we want to be like technically descriptively relevant, I think is the problem of despotism, is the fact that a constituency of the political entity is actually governing for the entirety. So capital investors are governing for labor investors included. And this is actually a fairly classic old problem that's called despotism in the history of uh, political um, history, in the history of democracy. And when one constituency actually dominates another one politically, we've seen across the ages how this has been overcome in order to start the democratization of the entity and it's called bicameralism or the history of bicameralism if you want or what I call a bicameral moment. That is a moment for instance when the patricians in Rome, in antique Rome, granted, accepted that the plebs had to be represented to co-govern Rome, so that the representatives of the plebs would have veto rights on the decisions that the patricians wanted to take. And I think we face such a moment today. We see in this pandemic more than ever that workers are essential. It's not you know, some leftist uh, sociologist who said that. Uh, workers have been recognized by governments across the world as some of them as essential workers and specifically specifically those workers who used to be we, we used not to see we was we was work we used to consider invisible take them for granted uh, and certainly not consider them as uh, important and, and dignified yet so workers uh, are actually the key uh, labor investors enabling firms to actually operate. So we should really move forward and understand that corporations are not like the end of history. Corporations is a way to structure capital investment. Firms is a bigger uh, story. It's the institution, the political entity in which a corporation is embedded and now we face the question, how are we going to democratize these entities so that the labor investors who are recognized essential today can actually participate in governing the firms? I think I'm, I'm gonna stop here so that uh, I, I leave it to others to, to speak to. Thank you, Isabel. Eric, please. Thank you, uh, Imran. Um, I would first like to start uh, my, my section with the fact that I'm an optimist uh, and that's also my disclaimer so I will definitely answer the, the question with, with yes we can um, and also I was positively surprised uh, during this past crisis uh, we're still in it but in, um, in this crisis we've seen that the, the, the behavior of people, um, it changed. And it changed very quickly and it also changed very thoroughly. So in, in a crisis, we are able to change. Uh, and one of the key questions that I would have is if there is a potential future crisis, which is a little bit further out, 
what can we do today to invoke that change? And that is, I think, where social sciences can really help out to find those answers. So we do need that change. And again, um, I think that we have seen that mankind is able to change. Um, but also in terms of corporations, I think we do need that change. And one of the specific examples that I really like from the Netherlands here is a company called Philips Electronics. And it's no longer a light bulb company or uh, a maker of televisions or uh, home appliances. Um, but their predominant business today centers around innovative medical healthcare. And they have been very clear in what their purpose is. And that is to use that innovative healthcare for reaching sustainable development goal number three, which is all about providing healthcare to all. So they have clearly targeted also for the year 2030, so that's a long-term target, um, a very specific number of, among others, reaching 400 million people in more remote areas with their healthcare services. Now that is a very clear goal. And it's 10 years out. And some might say, well, that's easy because it's so far away. I would say it's not easy because it's really challenging, but it's necessary to have such a long-term target because this will help to install breakthrough innovations, which you will otherwise not have with a one-year or a three-year plan. So we need those long-term targets. And along the way, of course, we need every year the progress towards those targets. But I'm very positive, and this is one of the companies here in the Netherlands um, that is able to advance and speed up during this crisis. So that's important as well. I think this crisis shows us that there is a certain urgency but it also is a moment to emerge stronger from that crisis. I don't think we should definitely choose between businesses, um, but I would more say that we should help businesses to transit. And I think if we can get the businesses on the right path, because there are a lot of people that are also working there, and they still have a function in society as well. Uh, it might not be a 100% sustainable business today, um, but I think we should focus on the transition. And with a clear goal in mind of what is sustainable, but if we would only choose what is sustainable today, I'm afraid we will be left with a few gaps um, also in what we would like to see in our daily lives. And then the last level, so I'm moving from the individual to the corporate level and now to the some more systemic level. I would like to share with you uh, an example from the Dutch Corporate Governance Code, where a few years ago, when that code was renewed, there was an extremely strong signal and a very important change, which said that the purpose of a corporation is not to meet the and create the shareholder value, but it is to create long-term value. And that is for a very different audience. It's for all stakeholders. It's uh, not only for the shareholders, so it's more inclusive. Um, and I think that signaled an important trend. Um, UK also followed afterwards with similar wording uh, and we see that more and more one of the the misconceptions is that that shareholders own a company and and legally that is not true shareholders own shares but they do not own the company um, it's the managers and the directors 
and the board that direct the activities of a company. Um, so when we will democratize a company, I think that is the level where we would need to start. So a question that, that might arise is, do we, um, uh, do we need to democratize a company um, at the level of the board and bring that all together there and follow on the path of uh, repurposing for longer term value creation? And that would mean that shareholders would move to a position where they are one of the stakeholders and more equal to other stakeholders than perhaps today, where there still is uh, a primacy of shareholders. So that is a question. Um, and I think we see some signals there of, of that movement. Um, the purpose of a corporation, I think, um, is something that is the, the talk of town. Um, besides the raison d'etre, uh, the B Corp, uh, and other uh, ways to announce, but also to, um, uh, to put the purpose into the, the charter firmly. Um, I think from the corporate side, that is the way forward to go. But from a shareholder side, um, I think there's also something to do there. And from a shareholder perspective, I think one can be supportive of a longer term goal and stay with the company. Or one can say, well, I'm in there for the return, I'm in there for the capital, and I will leave temporarily and come back when things are more brighter. Uh, but that is also a choice that we will, go, we will be going to see. So one of the questions I have uh, from a shareholder perspective is what, what is the long-term value creation from a shareholder perspective? Is that purely financial or is that also broader than just that? I would like to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Jeroen. Yeah. Um, well, it's fantastic to be back here at SASE. I haven't been for a couple of years and to come back in this setting is, is just amazing. Um, I'm very pleased to see that this current interest in practitioner engagement with at least 63, 64 attendees at this point, point in time. Uh, I'm also extremely happy to see Rosa and Eric here. So Rosa obviously represents a bank, but she's also, also been involved in Umedion, which is an institutional investor interest group. Uh, Eric was there as well. Eric worked for ICGN and is very, very much involved in reporting debate with the IRSC. So, you, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's in, it's, these are interesting people to work with and to, to see where they are heading with this debate. Uh, I guess my ticket to be here today is the Monaco Corporation project that we've been building up in, uh, from 2013 onwards, uh, which has basically developed into a milk stakeholder network. Uh, we started with, uh, with a Brussels-based NGO, Frank Bold, uh, and basically our question was, how can we redo corporate governance? Uh, how can we sort of refocus the debate in uh, corporate governance. Uh, that netted us the AOM Impact Prize last year, so that was sort of successful in the end. But more importantly, we managed to get uh, corporate governance into Section 10 of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan in the EU, so that's sort of our, um, our claim to fame. So how do we start? Um, the main thing is that systemic challenges, uh, including uh, the, 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 the challenge to planetary boundaries and uh, the, the move into inequality, is recognized by a very large set of actors. Uh, so it's not just the NGOs pushing for this, but it's definitely also insurers recognizing future mortgage risks. It's central banks and states uh, recognizing uh, that we need to do stress testing, that we will have to set different climate targets. It's the EU moving into the Green Deal, mandatory TCFD reporting in France and the UK. Uh, it's the NFRD moving into double materiality in the EU. Um, it's also Larry Fink speaking to investor risks and opportunities, and these are massive in the medium run, right? Uh, we can see that, uh, that, that assets will, will be allocated very differently in the near future. We can see that there's a massive amount of corporate risks and opportunities developing on the back of these uh, systemic risks. So business models will change, uh, will be challenged, we will have risk to global, to global value chains, we'll have legal risks in terms of liability, 
and we'll have risks in terms of uh, investor ESG and engagement that will shift the direction of boards. Now, all these issues and also the opportunities that arise from them are being recognized actively by practitioners. So we ran a series of workshops between 2014 and 2016 in multiple jurisdictions. And all these people were telling us, well, we have this shared sense of urgency and we recognize that this, that this is happening, but how do we engage? And that was quite interesting for us, more or less coming from the outside, seeing that all these practitioners who are at the heart of the field are struggling to find an answer, right? So if we have insufficient ways to engage from the inside, and then what, how, do we, how do we understand that? How can we engage with that? Um, so a very, a very core aspect of that, in my work at least, is this idea that short-termism short -term is actively embedded in institutions. And so how do we reimagine what corporate governance is and who it's for? So in that sense, corporate governance presents a wicked problem or a grand challenge in um, novel terms, uh, as we like to talk about it. And in that sense also, if we speak about repurposing the corporation, my understanding of that would be that we need to engage with a series of institutions and practitioner problems rather than with the corporation as an, as an institution in itself. It's this whole set of issues in company law, in reporting um, and in finance that needs to be comprehensively uh, engaged with by different sets of actors at the same time, right? So the Modern Corporation Project has been trying to to build uh, an environment in which these types of actors could engage with one another uh, and see what their individual problems were, but also how they related to all the other uh, broader problems and how that could then be related to manageable solutions. So obviously we had the NGOs on board because we work with Frank Bold in uh, Brussels. And then we started building an, an academic project uh, in which we worked for, in, for instance with Lane Stout, Martin Lipton, uh, J.P. Roubaix, Margaret Blair, David Miller, and Gerald Davis to uh, produce a set of statements that you can sign. So if you go to themoderncorporation.org or themoderncorporation.com, you'll find a series of statements that you can sign up to, including the latest one, which is the statement on uh, sustainability in corporate governance. Um, so once we had the academics on board and we had these statements, we started engaging more, uh, more directly with regulators, with investors, uh, and reporting standard setters and insurers. And then obviously we also looked at board members to see whether we could bring them on board. And we've, we've been sort of successful with that. That is the practical part of it. Now, in terms of the more theoretical part, uh, what we've been doing in the last couple of years is we've been uh, developing, uh, we've been looking at uh, regulatory developments and trying to find the uh, opportunities there. So in company law, SRI and reporting, We've been looking at regulatory coherence uh, as a project that's mostly run by Beata Schofield in Oslo. And we've been looking at comparative views to see whether, for instance, the French La Pacte or the Dutch Enterprise Chamber or the Dutch Pension Law might, might be interesting institutions that allow us to, uh, to, to, that, that allow us to, to think about best practices from one particular institution that could be uh, translated into a different setting. And then the final area that, that we've been looking at is to identify best practices in companies and to diffuse those potential solutions. So for instance, DSM, Unilever, Danone are really interesting examples from the, couple of, uh, from the last couple of years. Um, but also smaller mid cap companies have really, really interesting uh, setups for their, uh, for their governance. So those are the sort of the, 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 that's the, that's the background, that's the content. Uh, and then the last question is how do you overcome challenges of working with practitioners? And I guess the main thing is listen, right? I mean, as academics, we tend to focus very heavily on our own theoretical contributions and then ride our academic hobby horses rather than listen to what the problem is from a practitioner perspective. Um, and there's a lot that's happening out there, in my opinion, the World Economic Forum and the FT are more activist and more successful at this point than Extinction Rebellion, right? So they are leading the debate and they are making sure that stuff's happening out there. Um, so listen, be respectful of time and agendas and understand that the systemic nature of a lot of the institutions that you engage with are as controlling for practitioners as they are for the academics engaging with it. Um, so that's my, that's, my, uh, that's my story. 
And if you want to uh, be more active in this debate, first try and look at the moderncorporation.com and sign our statements. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the panelists. A wonderful uh, way to start us off. So we're going to move now to the question and answer session. And what I'll ask you to do is if you have a question, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A uh, tab you can press and you can type in your question. So we, we're trying to, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So we've decided to take questions uh, that way. And we actually apparently have a ability to comment uh, or, or rather upload questions. So we can take the, the most popular questions, you know, once, once, once they're put in. But in any case, we'll try to get up to all the questions. So please put that in. And I will start it off. I will take the chair's prerogative. I've had like four questions come into my mind just as we've been speaking, but I'll start with one. And, and I think and something that all the panelists have, have touched on, but I, so I know there are many Europeans in the audience today, and I'm speaking to you from the United States, from New York, actually. And, you know, since the crisis has started, since the coronavirus, COVID-19 crisis has started, we've had multiple intersecting crises, right? And you, it's not just been confined to the U.S., but here, of course, we've had a huge range of social protests, starting with uh, the, the George Floyd protests, but now just much, much more broadly kind of uh, influencing the, the U.S. political and economic sphere. So my question to the panelists, and this is for, for anyone, is how should corporations in this era, uh, where I think social concerns are going to be far more important than they had been, they've always been important, but they're much more salient, say, how does that fit into reshaping or restructuring of the modern corporation, or, or does it? So that's for, for, for any of you. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, you will have to unmute yourself. But, but again, and yes, Isabel, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a great question, Imran. Uh, I think uh, it's good to think uh, about one example. Uh, last year uh, in June, so that's 2019, uh, 8,000 workers, uh, Amazon workers, just from the US signed an open letter for the General Assembly that was held in June uh, to ask for uh, the General Assembly to actually decide to submit all the strategy of the firm uh, to the uh, guidelines um, identified by the IPCC. So really a call to uh, the corporation to submit its strategy to planetary boundaries and comply with them. And uh, these workers very courageously uh, uh, signed this letter in, an, in a not an anonymous uh, way, and uh, they were completely rebuked. And Jeff Bezos uh, told them it was not their business to, to care about that. And uh, we have seen actually in the past a month uh, how much he cares for his uh, workers. So um, it's, it's, it seems pretty clear, I guess, that if we don't uh, keep here a vision of some, some if you want, uh, um, way to understand that these are collective dynamics, that these are actors that uh, we're not going to deal with only at an individual level, only if we resort to appealing to their goodwill or their ethics, but it's really about thinking properly the institutional equipment that fit a democratic society that we're going to be able to find a way out of this crisis that will enable us to meet the big one crisis, with, which is the climate crisis. Thank you, Isabel. If I may add, Rosa, uh, Imran, well, well, for us, um, what we what we do in our finance and loan portfolio is, is is seek for these companies that are most resilient and that also comes back to how do they look at their assets uh, do they focus on on what what are called the debt assets 
or do they also focus on living assets? Um, so the way the system now is designed is that capital is actually the most scarce resource, but I think it's actually the people. So that's something that we, when we select companies, when we, um, yeah, we, we, we look at companies as an onion and we peel them and see how they really uh, uh, look after their, their staff, but also their wider stakeholder uh, and companies that do that, we consider those most resilient and those are the companies that we uh, like to invest in. Thank you. Uh, so what we'll do now, oh, Eric, please. Yes, Eric I, I would room, like please. to throw in what, one historical perspective here, um, which takes us back about a century, um, where we had the, the, the case of Ford, where uh, there was uh, a little bit of capital left uh, and the question on the table, should that capital be paid out as a dividend to shareholders or should it be paid out to workers in additional pay? And um, that was taken to court and, and the shareholder premacy was then founded in, in those rulings. Um, I'm not sure how the past century would have looked if that ruling would have been different, but, but that is a question that we can ask. Um, I would say it's 100 years ago. So this is how far that experiment has taken it. Us. And perhaps it's now time for a different experiment. Um, I would also like to add that, that what's important if we are going to move towards a different premise, if you like, um, I, I think it's important to realize that the benefits of no premacy, but more of an equilibrium among different players is what we need. So I'm in favor, don't get me wrong here, of financial returns as shareholders getting what they need, which is a financial return over the long term. I'm also in favor of workers and that they get what they need. But I like, and that's the best, uh, that we can combine the two, um, including all the other elements that, that are important here. And what we need for that going forward is the recognition of those different stakeholder and stakeholders groups and their interests, including those that are unborn or unable to sit at the table. Um, and what we also need is people to speak up. Uh, and that is our thing where, um, Dutch may have a history um, of speaking up. So instead of going to strike, our workers will speak up and sit at the table. So, th so there's a, sort of a, a, a talking culture here in the Netherlands. No one likes it, but it is helpful to reach a certain effective consensus and, and to reach a solution that's being carried and that's more balanced. Um, so resisting a hierarchy in that way uh, is helpful um, and really listening uh, is also helpful. Thank you. Um, if we don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to get to our Q&A, which, uh, which is really now uh, filled up. So, so I'm going to hand it over to Anna and really to the panelists, I would ask you to try and be as concise as possible, which I know is difficult with these complex issues because we have now already uh, five questions in the queue. So Anna, to you, please. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone for your very thought-provoking um, statements and, and your work over the past decades, actually, on this. Um, I'm going to try and bring together the five different questions that have been asked, and participants can also look at the Q&A for, for the questions themselves. Um, and I think one way of bringing the five questions together is around the question of politics. Um, so people are asking, um, what does democratization of a corporation actually look like? What is a good metric? Given that CSR has had fairly limited results over the last 20 years, what is a way of speeding that up and making corporations more accountable of, uh, because transparency doesn't really seem to work? And the second question about the politics of uh, corporations uh, comes from Daniel Kinderman, and I think it, it's, it's a it's a very good question, namely that a lot of the non-resilient older companies 
um, are supported by right-wing populists. So if we call for a reinvestment into sustainable companies, how can we prevent that from becoming a talking point for right-wing populists? And is there a way of uh, getting the populations uh, that work in those industries uh, on board for a democratic project? Thanks. Who would like to start? Isabel? <laughs> Um, yes, um, ready to go. Yes, yeah, thank you. Great questions. Um, well, it's, it's, um, oh, I'm going to try to be very concise, but I need to, to say two things. First, I, I do think that we cannot have a conversation about democratizing the firm without looking at other institutions as Yeroen just uh, said it in his uh, opening statement, and in particular, the institutions of the labor market. And it's very clear that if we want to be able to address democratizing firms and meeting the uh, planetary boundaries, we're going to have to shift uh, productions in some of those in old industries. And for that, we actually, I think, need a job guarantee. If we establish at the state level a job guarantee, we can then give people the guarantee that if their job is going to be lost in the ecological transition that is needed, they're going to have the guarantee that they can find another job. And that is actually the major source of, um, uh, of support for right-wing populists. So we need to take care of that. But as we do that, obviously, the, the strategy, I think, if we're now thinking about strategy to democratizing firms is really, uh, uh, I, I think, has to be sound in the sense that it needs to be grounded in a proper um, uh, uh, um, a, a sound theory. And this is why I, I think we, sh we should think of firms in terms of uh, political entities. And we should look at how in history we've managed to come out of uh, despotism. And this is where, uh, where indeed we have an insight in the bicameral history. And if I now uh, have to respond to the question um, that uh, Dustin raised about how can we go toward or can we implement that, it's the idea of a double majority you have today boards who have actually a majority, their majority, a majority in the board is required for any decision, the, the strategy of the firm to be decided. The idea is to implement a channel for representation of workers to have also the, the right to express themselves and to validate or veto the decisions of uh, the, the firm, the strategy of the firms, as the board is doing. And this is exactly what actually was, was that's the inside of the bicameral history. If you look at European firms, you already have that channel for representation. It's called the Works Council. And it's even established at the European level, it's called a European Works Council. And in some firms, they have even implemented that at the global level. They have a global world works councils, where actually uh, uh, workers in the various countries where these firms are present, workers elect their representatives on union, union lists to be sent to that uh, works councils. So you have actually there the, the anticipation of such a second chamber as in the bicameral history, but obviously today it's only a consultation uh, forum. And uh, I think indeed we have to deepen the rights that labor investors have in the context of every firm so that they can get the right to veto or validate the decisions. And you can actually see a statement that was signed by many, I think many of you actually, the democratizing work statement on democratizingwork.org uh, where you can continue spread this message. If I can just jump in and, and add uh, one dimension, I think Isabel has been mentioning this a little bit as well. So Maha Atal asked a fabulous question 
Um, namely, I know I'm just going to read this because it's so well put. Uh, will we run into state level democratic problems if we try to give Indian workers, say, oversight over German firms to indirectly employ them? So this is a question really looking at outsourcing global supply chains, looking at European and American companies outsourcing to cheaper production sites. Um, and so how can a sort of democratization of the corporation happen for workers in those countries? I would like, if, if you have something to say on that, I would just like to add that to the pool of questions. Maybe I can chip in there. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's multiple ways of answering that question. One is that potentially at some point the, the problematic will turn around when China comes in and buys our companies and we will be at the other end of the stick. Um, so that's one. The other thing is that, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of my criticality, I think the main issue that we're facing right now is the fact that whereas we were able to export our model very happily uh, when it served us. Um, we, haven't, we haven't solved many of these issues of what the status is of corporate group at a transnational level. We haven't solved what that means for taxation. How are we going to integrate these, uh, these issues uh, satisfactorily? So that is, that is a major issue. That is sort of at the macro level. Um, more directly, what I do see is that with the whole ESG debate, there's a massive move towards, uh, towards a much more integrated way to report. And one of the issues there is also, for instance, say on pay. And what we've seen in the last AGM season in the Netherlands is that the reporting on say on pay uh, allows investors to become much more vocal uh, on how they actually assess the, uh, the, the way in which the, which the firm is run and how we how we distribute different forms of, uh, of finance between different forms of uh, groups within the, within the company. Um, yeah, I'd like to leave it at that for now. Uh, then may I jump in then? Just to answer that question also, I totally think that we have to move beyond the existing legal boundaries. And we, we perfectly know that uh, the ways um, uh, firms have strategically used uh, the possibilities of the law uh, is actually to get rid of their own responsibilities. So this is where the concept of labor investors can be useful. If we think about workers actually producing uh, for, uh, I don't know, let's take a, 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 a computer company based in the US designing beautiful uh, uh, products uh, in um, in the Silicon Valley, but actually relying on thousands of thousands uh, of workers in China to manufacture them and even to send their own engineers in China to supervise the uh, assembly line. I think we have to recognize that these workers in China are actually labor investors in that big entity which is not, which has no name uh, so far, because obviously every bit has been, uh, you know, ch um, chopped into different legal bits. But we have to become capable to envision that as a, as the same political entity that needs to be democratized. And indeed, the profits that are actually captured today in a very small. Uh, pockets, space of the supply chain should be redistributed and those workers in China should be part of deciding about the strategy of this bigger firm. I know it can, it can sound a bit crazy, but this is uh, part of the thinking that uh, we should actually uh, research. And if I may add, I, I also think we shouldn't ignore the impact of the shareholders. Um, so I was very interested to see what happened when the known, uh, when 99% of the, the, the shareholders voted to change the mission of the corporation. I think that was fantastic news, but the stock market didn't react. Uh, it had so little impact on the share price of uh, the known. Um, and we've seen that also with Unilever where uh, Mr. Pullman was very much advanced in terms of ESG performance. And, and 
and, and, and I think did an excellent job, but still was punished for creating insufficient shareholder value. So if that force is so strong, then we, we need to not just concentrate on the corporation, but also how the financial system is currently designed. And it comes back to the, the previous question I raised, what will be the role of the shareholders in that new model? Will that be a role where they are getting their financial return, which I agree should be a fair return, but not the optimized maximum return, certainly not in the short term. Uh, or are they becoming one, uh, and in that way are becoming one of the stakeholders, or do they continue their premise? Uh, and if they do, then I think shareholders can be held accountable and responsible for a broader longer term value creation purpose uh, but um, i don't think you you can combine the two in, in the coming era where you combine the premacy of your power and the focus on maximizing one element which is money which is merely something that is a means, but not an end in itself. Um, I think that any solution that we will find needs to pay attention to two elements. Um, the first element is that we should really move away from where we got into trouble. And so the, the short-term focus, the focus on money, um, that, that, that's what we definitely should, should lose. And we should have a much broader focus. But the second element is also extremely important, I think, and that is that we pay enough attention to all the participants that are out there. So not just the workers, but also the future of our natural reserves, the ecosystem services, um, the unborn generations and also the shareholders because if you lose the shareholders you will also lose a lot uh, but they have a different function perhaps in that new era um, so i think that balance that we will need to find will not be something that we will reach overnight um, i think it's underway and it will take some time and some experiments some different experiments perhaps uh, to get there so let's move forward um, let's get into action. Let's try things. Uh, B Corp, uh, the moves from the known. Um, I think those are great initiatives. And we do not need to fix it perfectly at the first instance. So let's be creative and let's move forward and take out the best and move upward along the way. Thank you. Thank you for, for all those responses. So, so we're at uh time and i know everyone has many things to do so we're going to unfortunately not be able to get to all the questions but thank you for for putting those in um what i would like to do at this point is thank everyone thank all the panelists for all the work as anna said for that you've done over the years and today for, for offering such such wonderful insights to all the attendees for for your wonderful questions and and really Thank you for helping us to continue the, this initiative, the Social Sciences for the Real World Initiative. We are looking forward to the next version next year. If you have ideas for, for themes uh, for 2021, we, we very much appreciate it. You know, normally um, we, we have two panels, but this year because of you know, the difficulties of the situation, we had one, but we, we look forward to getting back to two panels uh, next year, but but again, thank you for attending. Thank you for, for being a part of this wonderful uh, initiative. Anna, would you like to say any 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 last words? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, thanks for everyone uh, to, to be for having been here, and also to all the audience. Um, I don't know what next year is going to look like. It's quite possible that it might look like this again, and. Um, if it does, we even more so need your input. So if you have any questions, suggestions, just email Imran, Gerhard, Isabel, or myself with uh, suggestions for, for themes, uh, because we really want this to be collaborative as possible. Thanks, and have a good rest of the conference.